want to say hi, so her screen pops up for all of you. Rebecca, you wanted to say a, a word or two? Or yeah, three? I just want to say thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. ADAPT is the gold standard for disaster preparedness, so I'm really excited to be working with you all and look forward to getting in. Um, my background is mostly in technology and business consulting, but I am starting to fall in love with disaster preparedness. <laughs> so, to doing what I can to get some cool stuff going with y'all. Rebecca, thank you. And you'll see Rebecca on our website very soon. We're gonna do our photos today. And in closing about the board, I'd like to let people know there's always opportunities to come join us at that leadership level on the board. So if you think you'd like to step up a bit further and be more involved, the learning has been amazing for me. Um, my colleagues on the board are, are just um, fantastic adapters. Everyone has their own expertise. So it's a real blessing to be involved on this board. And we just wanna let everyone know that if you are interested, please seek any one of us out, talk with us, and we'll see if that might work for you. Back to you, Colleen. I'm going on mute. <laughs> all right. Uh, Tom, would you like to tell us uh, what today's topic is all about and introduce the chief? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, welcome to our uh, July meeting. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, a number of issues that are coming up in the summer along with COVID that are very important to keep our focus on. Uh, and we will be discussing that uh, in a, a bit. Um, I'd like to introduce the chief who uh, has a couple of announcements for us. Morning, everyone, and uh, welcome, Rebecca, to the board, and thanks to the board members, our area coordinators, and all the adapters for the uh, that you do. Hopefully, you're all hearing me, correct? Yes, we are, chief. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> So unfortunately, I know that we've been building towards our large community exercise drill in September, but after speaking with Tom and discussing it with City Manager George Rodericks, it's just not feasible at this time with everything else going on with COVID. Um, but we do hope to have the drill as soon as possible and as soon as it's safe. And I think it does give us a great opportunity to continue to develop the plan for the drill. So when we do get the green light, it's shovel ready and we can get ready to go. Um, quick comments on COVID. Of course, COVID still continues. Everything's still fine at the police department. Uh, nobody has been contracted COVID and we're all doing great. If you might have saw from the announcement, so we were able to hire four new officers, uh, three from Menlo Park due to their layoffs and one officer is coming to us from the Stanford Department of Public Safety. So a lot of exciting things happening in the department, some new sergeant promotions, some new specialty positions. Uh, so all is going uh, great there. And then just again, as a reminder, and I know that Tom's going to be discussing it today, you know, the whole COVID pandemic <clears throat> gives us a taste of a disaster that we've talked about, that this is real. These are the things that we need to do. And I think the things that ADAPT does best, and we all need to continue to hammer on, is to make sure that people are ready to take care of themselves, take care of their neighbors, and take care of others until the police department and our resources can get constituted to then respond. So I think that's a continuing emphasis and COVID, one positive thing coming out of it gives us that springboard to do that. Also, just a quick comment on all the calls for police reform, defunding, deconstructing. I can tell you confidently and with council support that we are not defunding or deconstructing, just the exact opposite. I gave a detailed report to council on July 1st uh, about actions that our police department has done and will do and will continue to do. And what's great news is the majority of the calls for reform are nothing new. Um, as police executives, we've been practicing them for years, especially since 2015 uh, with 21st century policing from President Obama. So the police department is in very good shape there. That said, it doesn't mean that status quo lasts forever. There's always things that you can look at and improve and we are constantly doing that and I'm very proud of the work that our officers do. And I'm happy to, if people have any questions about, you know, COVID or police reform or actions 
Uh, I will pump out my presentation, and you're always welcome to call me at any time. Email with any questions. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. And with that, I'm going to close. So I'm unless there's any questions, unfortunately, you have to leave the meeting early. I'll stay long, on as long as I can, and then I'm going to have to go in about 10 or 15 minutes. Does anyone have a question for the chief? Um, I have a question. Hi, chief. It's Paul Jermaine. Good morning. Um, Hi, Paul. We, Hi, Dr. Paul. How are you doing? Um, are we still going to keep our police officers at our local schools, I hope? Yeah, so that's a good question, Paul. Um, not long ago, you may not have seen it, and I'm from the Seattle area, and it happened. I think Seattle was one of the first areas where the superintendent of public instruction up there came out, you know, very vocally and said they're severing all ties with their police department and their school resource program. So, you know, that concerned me. So I, right away I contacted all of our superintendents, the headmasters at the at private schools and at our college. And there was resounding, you know, resounding support for the police department, for our school resource officer program. So as of right now, as far as I know, we will be continuing that, particularly with the focus on our high school. And as you can imagine, the whole foundation of the school resource officer program is to build those relationships, to mitigate those issues about what is being called for reform now. So it's really counterintuitive and I think a real knee jerk to say police need to be out because more than ever, I think we need to be in the schools and we've always had a, we've had a school resource officer for, for decades <clears throat> and we've always had a very good relationship, especially now. So I anticipate that they would still remain so. Great. I agree with you a hundred percent. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Again, uh, Chief, thank you for your support of ADAPT uh, on behalf of the, the town council and George Rodericks. And um, thank you for your trust in us, especially with the COVID uh, deployment, which was a, a total success. Yeah, you're welcome. And I, you make a good suggestion about asking me for a food trailer and for the medical trailer. So on the medical trailer side, uh, when the time is correct, I'll get hold of Chief Chapel um, and see what we can do in that regard. And then I'll work uh, within George Roberts and the council on potential funding for a fourth trailer and logistics, et cetera. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. That leads us to our next item in the agenda, which is a discussion with Tom uh, about our summer priorities, basically. Tom, you want to kick us off with uh, a little something? A little something coming up. Real quick, um, I've known Rebecca now for almost two years. She's, very, uh, she's one of the coordinators of, of the Sharon Oaks community, their emergency response team. But just to give you a little background, she has a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Stanford and a Master's in Civil Engineering from California, uh, uh, UC Berkeley. She's a CERT. She's also a certified urban forester. Um, she's a professional uh, business and technology consultant. She founded a, a, a company which she rolled over. Um, and we are just so pleased to have someone who is as talented as uh, Rebecca on the board. So that's a little bit of a, an additional information. The other thing, Jeannie has done an incredible job. We've picked up four new EAP uh, locations which the signage is now in place. They are area 14 uh, with Helena So, um, area 8. No. No? Area, it, not 14. Okay. Four. Four, I'm sorry. Area 4 with Helena So, area 8 with Karen Hu, area 5 with Nancy Cho, and area 6 with area, uh, Eric, uh, area 6 is Eric Cowing. I want to thank the four of you for uh, stepping up and being such strong uh, contributors to our community. Thank you very much. That's a, a big step this year. Um, Colleen, um, why don't you go ahead. Uh, Colleen and I are gonna have a little uh, exchange about what we need to expect this summer. So Colleen, go ahead, please. All right, well, um, Tom, we recognize the, uh, the team and mostly you have put in a lot of thoughtful effort into creating our September drill simulation. And you created it specifically with the idea in mind that we would be practicing during a pandemic. So you put a lot of work into this, but things of course are just not going to allow us to move forward. So now that we're rescheduling the drill, 
what are ADAP's disaster pre preparation priorities for the rest of the summer? So to Colleen and to all of you uh, on the Zoom, we have four priorities for the summer and we had those priorities with or without the drill. Um, for me, the first one was canopy fire. There are three areas in Atherton that are literally like paradise up north and have ca canopy concerns. So I plan to talk about that. We just had the announcement of, on uh, July 8th by PG&E of extended brownouts. A brownout is a deliberate power outage. So whereas a power outage is caused by, you know, lightning or a car crash or a pole goes down, brownouts are intentional to reduce the uh, statewide usage. Um, and what that means to Athetonians, continued pandemic uh, awareness and what to be prepared for in October, and then earthquakes, which is what the drill is around. So those are our four topics today. Colleen? Unmute, sorry. <laughs> you know, you'd think after using Zoom for months now, I'd get used to that. Um, one of the things that scares me most are canopy fires. And after hearing, especially after hearing experiences from friends in the North Bay, is the preparation much different than what we normally think of as preparing for an earthquake? And how would we best prepare for a canopy fire in Atherton? So one of the interesting things about canopy fire is it's not, especially in Atherton, it's not just a summer event. It could actually happen as a result of an earthquake where power lines go down, uh, gas lines get ruptured, and you end up with um, fire as well as the, you know, the physical disruption from an earthquake. During the summer months, as I pointed out, we have three areas um, that are like paradise or similar to Woodside, Portola Valley. Um, in which there is extensive overgrowth of trees and vegetation in and around the home and in and around your streets, making evacuation rather difficult. Um, especially the access and egress issue in a canopy fire. The most important things to prepare for now are to clear your home of vegetation and tree overgrowth to the best you can and elicit your neighbors. I know that's sometimes difficult, but I did recently help a um, Atherton homeowner work with uh, uh, Mr. O Ovadia uh, of the uh, parks and, uh, of the um, uh, Public Works Department to work with his neighbor who had a dead tree on their property that was going to come over. So work with, you know, work with your uh, city uh, folks also work with your neighbors and get the clearings done. Have your go bags in place, also called bug out bags, so that if you have to evacuate, you can. Ensure that you have discussed your evacuation plan with your entire household and designate an out of Atherton location to which you can evacuate. That's very important in advance. Practice at least once a year, if not twice, actually evacuating from your home. You just call a drill, grab your go bags, go in the car and time it. Actually time how long it takes to get from your location to uh, the designated out of Atherton area. And note all the situations you encounter as you do it in normal, a normal situation. Obviously if it's an evacuation, there's going to be other um, issues at hand. The evacuation decision is a decision you don't make at the time of the fire. The evacuation is what you make a decision you make now. And we had a very extensive um, session on this about uh, last, last year. And it was decided among all of us who attended that evacuation is the correct thing to do. Trying to um, stand and defend is really, really, really not wise. So once you know that the first action is to evacuate, then you make sure your go bag is ready, you know your evacuation routes, and you get in your car with your family and you get out and allow the fire departments and Chief McCulley's uh, Atherton police to do what they need to do to um, address the situation. This is, this is real. This is um, probably as likely as an 
earthquake, maybe even more so. So those are my recommendations. By the way, all of what we talk about today will be posted most likely on the website or made available to you for those of you who want to have this um, to refer to. Thanks, Tom. Uh, that helps a lot in, in knowing what to think about. So the bug out bag that we prepare for earthquakes can do uh, double duty in this case, it sounds like. Yes, and uh, I, I, I do believe we are, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Colleen, we're preparing a video for, uh, uh, to provide folks for the, uh, to put one of those together. Yes, we are. And uh, we should be able to send out an email to our area coordinators with the link to that video pretty soon. Outstanding. Videos will be posted on the website as well. All right. So earlier, uh, you also mentioned PG&E's announced that it's going to be getting these uh, brownouts again. And I was wondering, is there an emergency component to this? Or are we really talking just about major inconvenience in some cases? Well, it actually, depending on the length of the brownout, it actually could turn into an emergency situation community-wide, but more likely maybe neighborhood uh, and family. And what I mean by that is, is if we have an extended um, brownout, refrigeration is affected, medical equipment that is necessary in your household is a is affected, your security systems are affected, and then basic life. So it's important to have an alternative power source, whether that be solar or that be um, generator, whichever or both that you use. You should be testing those now or installing those now if, if you wish, but definitely testing them now. So as, as I said, on uh, July 8th, uh, PG&E announced this. It's very important because, especially for those who have medical equipment in their home, to be able to, as seamlessly as possible, transfer over to an alternate power source. The other thing is, it's very important to have alternate lighting sources. So um, LED lanterns, which are very, very bright. Um, solar options, as well as battery options, are very important. The other thing too, it's important that as soon as the brownout happens, that as you have done with COVID, get a hold of your neighbors and check on each other, make sure that you can create a mutual support system, especially if the brownout lasts four, five, or six hours. Very good, thank you. That, that helps tremendously. Uh, so we talked about pandemics. And ADAPT was recently activated by Chief McCulley to help our neighbors during the first months of the pandemic. Since then, we've been inactivated. So what is ADAPT's role going forward with regard to COVID-19? Uh, I am so very proud of, of all of us. This is such a, an amazing topic. Um, I want to first congratulate and thank um, the ADAP area uh, and block coordinators in their successful 81 day Atherton police authorized um, pandemic deployment in which 77 of us um, of our community and our responders um, went out throughout the community. And thank you, Chief, for your, your trust in us. Uh, this pandemic reminds us to make sure that we have ample supply of surgical gloves, at least 100, N95 or surgical masks, at least 50, and a variety of personal and home sanitizers. Again, for at least a month or more, uh, all of which can be purchased at Costco, Amazon, or most pharmacies, even Safeway. It is important uh, now that there are no restrictions on uh, those various items and those items are currently available, go ahead and stock up now before um, October when it is anticipated because COVID like every other flu and all the other flus like H5N1, which is still prevalent, um, are seasonal. So therefore, you know, they die off in April and they come back in October. So be prepared so you don't have to get caught up in the onslaught of getting in, you know, a one mile line at Costco. Be prepared now and adapt if necessary uh, will in fact get redeployed in that October timeframe by the chief if he deems it necessary. 
and we will then again execute an incre incredibly seamless and successful operation as we did before. Great, thank you. So that brings us um, to earthquakes then. Uh, one of the problems we have, we have been involved with the pandemic at this point, but you know, we could have an earthquake too because earthquakes really don't care if we're busy doing other things. So if we aren't doing the drill in September, how should we be thinking about preparing for an earthquake at this point? The, uh, the drills that we had in September were a, what's called a community emergency drill. It is the activity that occurred after you have taken care of your family, after you've taken care of your neighborhood, and then when that was done, you went to your ICP, the, the three that we have designated at uh, uh, the uh, Luger household, the uh, police station or Holbrook Palmer Park, or at um, the Nicholson household, and you would set up an ICP, each for East, Central, and West Atherton. What I'm gonna talk about today is what happens before then, okay? So the first thing you're gonna do is if an earthquake happens, you know, you do your duck and cover, you maintain, maintain your safety. You do your own personal health check. You check for wounds and sprains and fractures. Make sure you're safe. You assemble your family. You get everyone in the household. Uh, in a safe space and assess their health, and you call 911 if necessary. It's very important, even though we know that we're going to be on our own for seven days without public services, the sooner you get your 911 call in uh, and describe to the dispatcher what your issue is, the sooner you're going to get response to hopefully our EAP um, to help you. So, because it's based on severity of injury and first in, first out. So it's important to get your 911 call in. Do not get discouraged if the 911 call gets a, a, a beep because they will be overwhelmed. Then step back for a bit and make the call when you can. You organize your family members and you really should be doing this before the fact so that everyone knows what to do and each individual in your family has a, an assignment. You create a communication network, so to speak, in your family. Um, and everyone knows how to use um, an FRS radio. If you don't have one, purchase one. Know how, knows how to use their voice, command voice, and knows how to use a whistle. One for a, you know, a, attention, two for attention on me, and three, emergency. Those are uh, simple uh, whistle signals that are used by the Coast Guard. Attention, everyone two whistles, attention on me, three whistles, emergency. Um, perform all the triage on a family level, make sure that everybody is okay. Uh, try to stabilize the medical issues as you can. Then you set yourself about walking your property. It's important that just like we do in a drill, you do reconnaissance first. You find out, you, you know, you're out of your home, you check the property all the way around you. You're checking your neighbor's property. You're looking at how, how the house looks because the most important thing to remember is aftershocks. It's not so much the earthquake that's going to cause problems. It is obviously disruptive and an issue. It's the aftershocks in which most injuries and deaths occur. Uh, and there will be at least three and they will be within a close magnitude of the actual earthquake. So check out, make sure the water, you know, you know, check out on your electrical systems, your water systems, um, and your gas systems. You do not turn off the gas unless you see a clear uh, need to do so. Uh, you may want to turn off your electrical panel, and you probably will want to turn off your water system so you don't have contamination for the water that is in your house. Um, check on your pets. Pets are a vital part of the psychology of your family and the well-being uh, and in disaster psychology pets are very important so check on your pets move your car to the driveway facing outward so that if you have to evacuate you can do so seamlessly without creating a traffic problem in addition to uh, having your car on the driveway make sure you have your fire extinguishers uh, next to the vehicle 
Now the car is a very important uh, asset to you uh, at the edge of your driveway facing out because it is both shelter, it is security and a source of power. So again, um, and in the case of evacuation, then you can move very easily and seamlessly out into the flow of the rest of your neighbors evacuating. Then check on your immediate neighbors, repeat um, steps one through seven that I've just outlined, and then prepare for backyard camping out for seven days. Um, if you have a clearing that is that you know is uh, free from tree fall, then you're going to camp out uh, in, you know, in your backyard, uh, which means that you will have to have a, a, a camping cache in uh, some kind of container or shed in your backyard. Uh, we have the, the, folk, uh, the uh, outline for that on our website, so take a look at that. Um, and only at, if your home is compromised, then you would report to your EAP for sheltering um, and you would report and you would bring with you whatever supplies. So if your home is, is destroyed and you can't camp out in the backyard, then you would report to your EAP. After you've done all these, all of those of you who can then report to the EAP as well to set up your emergency assembly point operation. It is from there that you will be in communications upward to our Atherton EOC and our ICP so that we can dispatch um, either CERT members or emergency responders to your EAP to handle the injuries that you will probably have because we want all of the injuries to go to the EAP. So what do you do after you've completed all of the in-home activity? Again, remember CERT, take care of yourself first, take care of yourself, your family second, check out your neighbors, and then you take care of your community. So within each of your uh, areas or, there, or within a group of areas, there's an EAP. As I said, it's at the Luger House, the uh, Nicholson House, uh, and at Holbrook Palmer Park uh, currently. When you get to your EAP or your, or your neighborhood, whichever, uh, again, this applies to both, the first person who shows up is in charge. The second person who shows up is the scribe. So you, immediately you want to start recording. You continue to uh, assess your uh, neighbors. You do not enter damaged buildings. You report the status of what is going on in your neighborhood as you report either to your neighborhood uh, central location or your area EAP and you bring your cert bag or your bug out bag. You assemble. And when you assemble in your neighborhood or at the EAP, you decide what you're going to do. Again, first person is area coordinator, is the IC, the incident commander. The second one is the scribe. You start establishing roles. You know, who's gonna be in charge of communication? Who's gonna take care of operations, reconnaissance? Who's going to take care of crowd and traffic control? Because it's very important to keep the streets clear. And that doubles as security. Who's going to take care of logistics, medical, and search and rescue? And if necessary, shelter, sheltering. Hopefully the sheltering can happen in the backyard campgrounds, but you may have to be able to shelter folks at the um, your designated areas. We take into consideration the weather, the households, the injuries, what damage is going on around you? What fires are going on around you? Is there any toxic releases around you? Um, and what are the road obstructions? Uh, road obstructions are gonna be very, very important. So for a lot of you in the areas that I, pre I designated before as canopy areas, you should also have a chainsaw. It doesn't have to be a big chainsaw, but something that you can, you can clear uh, down trees with. You set up your, your EAP, your uh, emergency assembly point, probably need some tables and chairs, some scribing tools, some lighting, at least a, can, at least a couple of canopies, one for the, the organization and one for um, medical, and then uh, you set up your staging areas. So who, who's involved in a neighborhood organization? Well, you have your IC and scribe, the incident commander. You're gonna have someone who's, uh, who's working the radios, communications, at least two people, 
preferably, uh, preferably FRS and HAM. Hopefully you have both of those. Um, you're going to need someone who does operations, um, at least two folks there, crowd control, at least two. Logistics, you probably want a team of two. Your medical teams will be teams of two. And then rapid response um, teams will be also uh, a minimum of two, most likely three. Um, and then shelter operations is, you know, setting up a good team to think in advance how you want to handle your neighborhood refugees, how you're going to set them up in a way that it doesn't um, pose a, uh, a clogging factor to the, what you're up to. Make sure that when you show up, bring your uh, GMR or FRS radios, bring your ham radios. The communications unit then will start setting up a net so that you can communicate throughout your neighborhood or your area so that we can then do uh, activities like reconnaissance and um, emergency response. If you have a ham radio operator in your neighborhood, that means you will also have direct contract with the town of Atherton EOC, which will be very important so that we can dispatch resources to you. Um, the next, and I, what I consider one of the most, probably the most important thing after you set up communications, you have to have communications first, is getting people in the field. Whether they be two person teams or three person teams, will be uh, dependent upon how many uh, folks you have to do so. Uh, you do not send out any reconnaissance teams until after you have a minimum of three people in your ICP or your EAP area. But they're going out again to check on what's, what's happening in the households in the area, what are the injuries, what's the damage, what's the fire, are there any toxic materials in road obstruction. And they're calling that back in the same way as we do it in a drill. Your reconnaissance teams are calling back to communications as to what's happening in the field so that your incident commander and your logistics and operations can start planning how you're going to go back into the field and assist those who in most cases are injured or may be trapped. You set up traffic control and crowd control so that you have a, just as you know, Mary Lou Schiavo and Susan Spiker and others did in our drill and they've done a brilliant job doing so. It's to make sure that there is a, a, a clean, clear flow of both vehicles and people and, and emergency responders as yourself so you don't get clogged up. That's the worst thing that can happen. So it's important to have traffic and crowd control. And in addition, they provide your security. You prepare a first aid station at your EAP or in your neighborhood so that when people are being brought in who are injured, they're being placed under hopefully a canopy. And you, those of you who are certs, you are applying the basic first aid that you learned at cert. You're not being asked to do any more than that, but you know, how to stop the bleed, um, you know, how to treat shock, uh, how to calm an individual, you know, how to um, compress uh, blood flow, uh, isolate a broken uh, limb, those kinds of things, those of you who are search, and we're going to continue to, we're going to be putting together some videos put together by our CERT medical team on how to do each one of those, and those will be available on the website. It is, in fact, one of our goals, and, you know, the, all the doctors on our uh, team will be uh, putting that together, which I'm really excited about. Um, it's important that when you're in the field, no matter what, you're going to have helmets and gloves, surgical gloves, work gloves, goggles, you want headlamps. Um, when you are arriving at the EAP from your homes, you know, bring some equipment. If you have stretchers, do so. Obviously, if the EAP happens to be at the Luger or Nicholson uh, home, um, then we will have a trailer there, or if it's at Holbrook Palmer Park. But again, bring as many supplies as you can and form teams, stay calm, and do what you can to keep everyone grounded. That's gonna be the most important thing and operate at an even pace. You prepare for a seven day operation. So 
early on set up security, figure out how to do that in a, in a sane way, in a way that is, um, makes sense and accomplishes the task. Create sh a shelter coverings uh, as you can uh, for those who cannot uh, camp out in their backyard. Start uh, establishing a water distribution plan, figure out how to collect water, get water, um, and distribute it. You're going to want to um, have bring with you or have at your uh, central point uh, first aid supplies and begin injury treatment. You want to do medication monitoring. So you're looking for, especially over by the second day, you're, you're watching for people who have allerg uh, allergy medication, antidepressants, um, medication for diabetes or heart conditions and other conditions. So it turns out that one of the, come day two, one of the biggest factors besides hygiene is going to be people not on their meds. So you wanna be aware of that to the best you can. Child and pet care is really important. And we already did, as you know, uh, before COVID happened, we did an excellent uh, session on child care and pet care. Uh, that's part of disaster psychology, keeping the children calm, keeping them act active in other activities than uh, quite possibly the potential fear of an earthquake um, and the same for pets. So you put attention on that. Hygiene and sanitation, very, very important. Um, a lot of um, complications occur because sanitation and hygiene is compromised. So you want to figure that out early. You want to keep the area clean. You want to keep it as uh, hygienic as it is possible. Figure out your lat latrine situation. Um, just like COVID, you want to you want to make sanitation very, very important. You're going to want to make sure that you um, keep people warm, both both in the day and at night. Figure out your fire configurations, uh, outdoor fires. Um, or if you wish to do that with fire pits or barbecue pits. Distribute clothing as necessary. Figure out long-term, because we're gonna be out there for seven days. So figure out long-term food preservation and food distribution. Folks who have a alternate power will be able to keep their freezers and refrigerators up. Those who don't, then you want to distribute the, the food out of your refrigerators first and freezers second. A freezer will stay completely frozen for about 24 to 48 hours if you don't open it after a, an earthquake. So you have time to distribute that food and prepare it. Um, if you can, in a, in a neighborhood setup, you know, bring some alternative generators. You know, the uh, Honda 350s and the Honda 250s uh, are really good portable generators that can drive uh, lots of uh, lighting as well as um, uh, communications equipment and other auxiliary equipment. Um, and then you obviously have your car as an aux, uh, alternative um, power source. Lighting is very important both day and night because it is a security um, uh, issue and it prevents people from, people don't like uh, borrowing stuff from people if they know it's well a clean, well-lighted place and there's lots of activity. So it's a security issue as well as a safety issue. Um, use lanterns, especially LED or propane. Again, lighting is important. It also has a psychological um, benefit, has a psychological benefit in that when things are lighted, even in the daytime, people know, feel like they're safe. There's not an unknown. Darkness creates an unknown on a subliminal level and by having well-lighted places, it, it helps. Firefighting, know how to use a hydrant if you can. Um, know how to use your pool if you have a pump. Uh, fire extinguishers, again, you're not being asked to do large-scale fire suppression, but if you can knock down some small fires when they happen so they don't grow into big fires and grow into canopy fires, then you don't have to evacuate. So be familiar with your own firefighting skills um, and talk to your neighbors about that. It's very, very important. And then tree and obstacle clearing is important. Um, if, you, if you're gonna need to evacuate, it's going to be important to be able to clear a path. And I really recommend that those, 
individuals who are in the three areas that are heavily canopied. I really believe that along with a fire extinguisher, you should have uh, um, some way of doing tree clearing. Um, it is important so that with a chainsaw, you can cut your way through things, cut down uh, excessive uh, foliage so you don't create a fire and that you with your neighbors can clear a path to evacuate. And always be prepared to evacuate so that when you know you have to, you can do it in a seamless and organized manner. You want to talk to your neighbors about it so that as all of you are exiting your driveways, you're doing it in a calm um, segue manner so that you all can get out if you have to. So those are the major um, components of how a neighborhood gets organized. It's a checklist. It has boxes and uh, I'm actually reading from the checklist. It has a bunch of boxes. Uh, we will have that available to you also so that it does not matter how much experience you have in emergency re response, whether you're a CERT or non-CERT. You can go through that checklist and not only take care of your family first, but then you can roll it up into a uh, neighborhood readiness and accomplish all that you need to do to successfully um, get through a major earthquake for seven days. Well, that's great information, Tom. I'm hoping that perhaps in uh, a future meeting, you'll be able to review some of this information and uh, we'll be able to look at it more in depth. Yes, as a matter of fact, Colleen, thank you for reminding me. I, I should have mentioned that. In our August meeting, we are going to do a deep dive into this, organi this organizational model so that you in your neighborhoods and with your family are going to be really comfortable in knowing how to, after you take care of your family, organize your neighborhood. And we will have the checklist up on our website so that you can have it present, especially if we do it in a Zoom format, which we probably will. Um, maybe not, who knows. But if we don't, then we'll have the checklist available for you to pick up at the meeting. It is important that this become part of your knowledge base and that you once in a while practice it. Uh, with your neighbors. Um, so I look forward to our August meeting where I can go into a deeper dive. Fantastic. Thank you. And I'm also available, by the way, with Zoom, which I've, I've already done four neighborhood presentations so far in the last two months. Um, I'm available to do Zoom presentations to your neighborhoods, if you wish. Um, you know, just get a hold of me at uh, T Pressing. Uh, or go to, actually, I guess, uh, getreadyatherton.org and my email's on there. Fantastic. All right. Well, that brings us to our next few items on the agenda. We, um, we're actually ahead of schedule. So Yes, we are. Isn't that amazing, Colleen? Yeah, it's uh, yeah. That's great. That was a lot of information to pack into a, uh, a short presentation. So thank you for that, Tom. Well, you're most welcome. So Jeannie uh, is up next. Uh, she is our outreach board member and she's going to uh, talk about some volunteer opportunities for us. I'm gonna switch us back yeah. to uh, the gallery view so we can see each other. Hello everyone. Um, just a quick plug for block coordinators. I know in the beginning of the call, I talked about area coordinators. Those are the people that are the representatives for the 14 different areas that the fire department has divided our town into. Block coordinators, we actually have a few block coordinators on the call today. We have Anita, um, Nelson, and I think a few other people who are uh, block coordinators. So they're, they're kind of in charge of their block or a few streets within the area and work with the area coordinator. So they're even an even more localized version of volunteers. So we are always looking for more. We can never have enough. Um, Sindra, as you might've seen in, the, in our recent email to everyone, um, Sindra facilitated a training and recruited a bunch of block coordinators for her area in area 10. And um, that's been a wonderful thing to just help out during COVID and checking on our neighbors, but also with, um, you know, the rest of the year of just making sure that everyone is prepared and doing what Tom said, the more people who are involved and know the process. 
at least know where our EAP is, is great um, at the very least. And then we're also always looking for, a, you know, area coordinators, like I said in the beginning, for area four, five, and part of six. And then there's other roles that we, we always welcome help with, right? Whether it's um, more outreach help or more technology help or anything in between. So please reach out and go to our website um, to let us know your skill set and how you can contribute if you would like to. Yeah. Thank you, Jeannie. I just want to add one little thing to that. You may be thinking, well, why doesn't ADAPT do X? And you should consider that a volunteer opportunity because <laughs> there are so many things we would love to do and just don't have the bandwidth to make happen. So if you feel like we need to be doing something, please come talk to us about it. And we'll see if uh, maybe we can get you a team to work with if needed, or maybe it's something that you can just help us execute um, with your own. And that's what uh, Jeannie means by there are lots of opportunities out there. So join us, we'd love to have you. All right, so our next uh, report is the treasurer's report. That's a short one as usual. Um, in our bank accounts now for the ADAPT accounts, we have $3,884.26, thanks to your generosity. So we, we value that support. This helps us do small things uh, like, well, some are actually pretty important things like paying for our website and making sure we have the communication going out to our community. So thank you for that. We encourage you, of course, to give us any excess money you might have lying around. And you can either do that by just sending us a direct check, or of course, just as a reminder, um, if any of you are shopping online as much as I am these days, because I'm no longer going to stores, and I've noticed that sometimes when you go to the store, they don't have anything anyway, because the shelves are bare, so that online shopping you're doing, uh, consider using Amazon Smile. Uh, we do get checks regularly from them. And uh, you know it's a small percentage, but those little small percentages add up uh, with all of us doing our purchasing. Let's see, with that, um, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Tom, who is going to uh, say a few words in closing, unless there are, are there any questions or concerns of anyone that we should talk about yes let's have a time let's have some time for questions and uh um and concerns as you point out joan if you can't figure out how to, oh joan yeah great let me unmute you uh, i have a question i haven't looked at the cert district maps real recently um are we going to have a symbol and have the trailer where the trailers are located added to the maps uh, yes, we are. As a matter, of, great question. Yes, we are, and we have to. Um, we'll have to get together with um, whoever's taking over the maps from Ramona Murray, or have her do it. Uh, you may be aware that CERT is being reorganized. There's a uh, by the fire department. Um, there's a new uh, program director. We have a new um, re a direct report. His name is Ryan Zollerkoffer, who is in charge of. Uh, emergency uh, services for the entire area. Our new program director is a man by the name of um, Andres uh, Acevedos from San Jose State. He was in charge of their uh, disaster response program. And uh, we're in the midst of a reorganization, but that is a, a very high priority, uh, Joan, to get those on the map. And I'm hoping to get the funding to get a fourth trailer for what I call the far west part of Atherton. So we have four trailers plus a medical trailer that Paul Jamilian, Dr. Paul, is a lot working along with, you know, um, um, Earl and uh, the, the doctors Warren and Bar Barbara, Dr. Barbara, to uh, make sure that we have a really uh, robust medical trailer. So, uh, yes, I will make sure that happens. Thank you. Just to confirm, by the way, the EAP locations are. Uh, uh, Linda Griffin in area six on Walnut, and then it was just, um, and then Steve and Cecilia Chen in area 13 and um, in area four. 
um, and and um, lastly was Syndra Nicholson in Area 10. So right where the trailer is, like Tom referenced, that's where the sign now is too. So that's going to be a great hub for one of the locations. Jeannie, this is Wally Sleaf. In Area 1, my house has an EAP. Diane Crittenden has an EAP in Area 2. And the Lugers have an EAP at their place as well. Perfect. Yes, those were, yeah. I, sorry, I should have clarified. The ones that we just installed a week ago were the ones I was talking about. But yes, we have lots of EAPs all over. Uh, thank you to all of you guys who let us put a sign in front of your yard <laughs> for the betterment of our community. So thanks, Wally and team. And because of our areas are and our areas are so big, um, we still need more EAPs. So if you would like to uh, have an EAP. Uh, uh, as part of your uh, commitment to the community. Uh, talk with Jeannie, uh, she'll work with the, uh, the town to get that set up. It's put on the, um, the actual signage is put on the Atherton town property, not on your property. And if somebody asked me, well, why would I want an EAP in front of my house? And I told them, I said, well, it might be a good thing if in an earthquake, all the folks are coming to the front of your house to help your entire neighborhood, which gives you a resource to stay safe, to stay healthy, to stay resilient. So it's actually a benefit rather than a deficit to have those folks um, coordinating with you the response in your neighborhood. You know, just to add to that, Tom, there is one other nice benefit that uh, could be of a concern as well. If we have looting uh, starting to happen, as sometimes happens in disasters, the houses that get looted are not the ones with all the activity in front of them. They're the ones with no activity. So you can think of uh, that EAP sign as a security measure as well. Mm -hmm. and, there you go. To, and to your point, Colleen, which is why early on in, and we'll, you know, we'll do a deep dive about this uh, at our next meeting, but it's important to establish that crowd traffic control group in your neighborhoods. Uh, because they become security. Uh, when I did profiling with the FBI a long time ago, far, far away, the one thing that bad, uh, bad people don't like is large groups of people who look like they know what they're doing and act like they know what they're doing and seem to be really grounded and have a pleasant disposition. They stay away and go somewhere else. So again, having an EAP and having a large group of people out in the street doing what they do best, which is taking care of their neighbors, is going to keep the folks who want to come over and borrow your stuff and not bring it back from going somewhere else. <laughs> I like that borrow your stuff part. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, are there any last questions, final call for questions, concerns, or minor annoyances? All right. Looks well, clear to me. I'm going to uh, pass it over, Tom. Do you have any closing words? Yes, I do. I'd like to just uh, quickly recap what we covered today because it's important going forward. The summer is going to be busy. COVID has obviously taken our minds and, and our hearts and our, and our physical focus, but there are other things going on. Canopy fire, canopy fire, canopy fire. It is important whether you are in the areas where there's heavy overgrowth or there is not. If you're adjacent, this is important to you. Clear your properties of excess vegetation, have a bug out bag, and know your evacuation plan. PG&E brownouts, they're going to happen. They could last as long as six, four to six to eight hours, hopefully not. So have alternative power available, especially for medical equipment and refrigeration and security systems in your house. Make sure you have adequate lighting that includes LED batteries and whatnot. COVID, again, get your equipment now masks, gloves, and the various kinds of sanitizers. As I said, Amazon, Costco, the pharmacies, you know, Safeway, wherever. Get it now when we don't have, where supplies are abundant and we don't have uh, limitations. And then be aware of earthquakes, you know, refresh your earthquake mindset. Uh, there've been lots of earthquakes around the world, especially along the, you know, the dragons, dragon's rim in the Pacific. So uh, be prepared for that. So we have four real genuine concerns that we search, you know, don't lament, we don't get hyperbolic about, 
we just get grounded about, we think ahead, and then should they happen, we respond accordingly. Again, I'd like to thank the 77 folks who were involved in the COVID-19 response. I want to thank the chief for trusting us. We did an awesome job. We even had uh, three 911 calls. We had a number, we had the six, actually had seven uh, police assists. We did some amazing stuff to help people out. Um, keep that mindset going. Um, take it, ex take the COVID experience and spread your, like a virus, sp <laughs> spread your cert knowledge into the neighborhood, get people involved, um, you know, mask on, social distancing, doing all the appropriate things, but let's capitalize on that brilliant effort that we did and move forward. And again, thank you to all of you who are on the, uh, you, uh, the Zoom today. All right, with that. Thank you. Our uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for attending, and we'll see you in a month. Thank you. Bye, all.